I can only reach out a gigantic middle finger to all sensitivity readers and anybody who's censoring Roald Dahl or, uh, you know, Ian Fleming. That is just, it drives me up the wall bonkers. Just don't consume it then. You've got to preserve these works of art and they've been successful and awarded for a reason. These, these are masterpieces of our culture and if you can't handle it, then you shouldn't consume it. But going back and changing for these arbitrary reasons and we all could go much deeper into that with uh, but it will get us all into hot water is that there are powers to be at work right now that are so sinister and beyond even the well-meaning on the surface well-meaning uh, agenda that's going on here that is it's it's, it's really um, it makes me scared welcome to the new flesh podcast the podcast you deserve my name is Jonathan Asher and with me as always is my partner in crime Ricky Allpark Ricky how are you today I'm uh, very well thank you Yes, well, today is, is we're going to geek out today. Did, did you ever have posters on your wall as a growing up? I did, yeah, of course. What, which one? What would you have? Uh, well, I had a number of sort of music posters, also a, a lot of basketball posters, you know, Shaq, Alonzo Mourning, you know. But, but I, had, I had music ones too, you know. I, had, had, I actually had a real, quite a good Doors poster up, Jimi Hendrix poster. Um, I had a really good Miles Davis one, actually. These are good because uh, today we're talking to Tony Stella, who's an incredible uh, visual artist, uh, illustrator. He's done movie posters, album artwork, and you know. So if you if you think you might not be uh, down with 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 this with this topic, please stick around because his work is incredible. And uh, I just you know, it's hard to, to get it across in audio. I mean, you've seen it, Ricky. It's 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 just amazing to look at. It is amazing. You, you go to this guy's website and just scroll through. I mean, he's got a whole archive of, of images and, you know, there's so much to like there. It's blowing blowing my mind. Yes. Well, uh, let's get into it. Uh, I, I, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Okay. Well, before we do that, we always tell you the truth here at the New Flash Podcast. And the truth is that we need your help. We need you to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to the show. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment about the show you liked, or perhaps one that you didn't. We do live in a democracy after all. Now, word of mouth is also a very powerful tool, so please tell all your friends. And finally, to our Uber fans, if you love what we do, you can send us a little cash via the Buy Me A Coffee platform. Any donation here is very much appreciated. Now, on with the show. Tony Stella is an illustrator and artist. His hand-drawn work encompasses film, music, and advertising. You can see his work at TonyStella.com. There, you will see incredible artwork that uses composition and color in such a way that it sends the imagination soaring. He's here with us now to talk about his work, his process, and the films that inspire him. Tony, welcome to The New Flesh. Hi right, guys, thank you for the invite, and I must apologize to your listeners. I'm a little bit, I've been sick for the last month, and I can't shake it. I don't know what it is. I don't want to go too far into conspiracy land right off the bat, but <laughs> uh, uh, I think it might just be my daughter, my daughter's kindergarten sort of uh, things that keep going round and round, but I've just been knocked out. So um, yeah, I apologize for my sort of uh, nasally uh, uh, tone here. Well, I think it's because you probably worked too hard, Tony. Now, uh, how did you find yourself illustrating movie posters for a living? What, what What's your story? Well, sort of like, I don't know, a lot of 80s kids that grew up in the 80s can share that when the VHS first came into our lives. And uh, in the old days, movies held such a big mythology in all our lives because we would catch it sort of at the end of a programming and then you would have to reimagine, you know, the ending that you never saw. And then on the playground, reenact that with your friends and somebody always had like a little tidbit of information. And so these movies would grow to such a big mythology in our lives. And as the VHS came in, um, um, what we connected most with was, was the artwork, the box art. So we first saw the beyond the movie poster, we could now actually own one of those and, and take that home and sort of like, like LPs, like vinyl in the old days, while you listen to the song, you open the gatefold and you see the liner notes and you kind of live through the artwork and it would create this whole nother dimension to in, interact with the movie after it was over. So, and of course you couldn't always have the official uh, release, especially abroad, you know, growing up in Germany and Italy, we didn't have, sometimes it would be delayed. Sometimes it would be a different artwork or we couldn't own the official release and we would record it off the TV. So I really started to adorn my own VHS covers with these elaborate designs and try to copy, you know, all the masters, Tom Young and Drew Struzan and whoever else that I had no idea who they were 
uh, I just loved that artwork so much. And um, they would grow into these really sort of elaborate outside the cover art sort of a way to engage with the movie after it was over. And that was the first sort of gateway drug into it. And I've continued ever since um, to sort of interact with movies like that. Even through my teenage years when we'd watch it in a big group of guys, I would sketch and draw on the pizza carton while the movie was playing. And I, it was just wow. a way for me to always in, interact with, with, uh, with my heroes, so to speak. Do you have any of those pizza boxes still around? Yeah, one of my friends who's, it's it's great. I mean, his house is a complete mythology because his mother used to, um, uh, she has a big role in our movie love because she she um, she um was a, a single mom and she was super cool. She Even on school nights when we used to come home like three o'clock in the morning from some illegal graffiti mission or something, she wouldn't go like, you guys got to go to bed. She was like, you haven't watched the Antoine Doinez series? That's a crime. You have to watch these movies. And she would give us these. And her whole house, she was the distributor for Uni France, which is the French uh, movie distribution in Germany for the French movies. So she knew uh, uh, Alain Delon and Lino Ventura, and she interacted with those guys. So her, their whole house, I think the only space that was free was the doorways and the windows. Everything else was VHS. It was better selection than any VHS store, sometimes still wrapped in the box, and we could just sort of wander the hallways there while she would cook. If there was a TV going on in every room with movies, or and you just sort of live in that. And uh, it was a very seamless way to interact with these movies. There was just you'd catch something even that you wouldn't be interested at twelve or thirteen because it was new by Vark, but it was on, so you kind of catch yourself watching these things. And she would put a really high, as did my parents. But um, that house, especially. Um, uh, to get back to your question, yes. So he has a lot of the old artwork that I would sketch. Too totally silly, but it's still in, amongst their collection in their crazy, beautiful apartment. She's still there. She's, there's like pianos and vinyl, and it's it's a palace. I, somebody should really document it uh, in a photo book. It's, it's magic. It sounds like you had a very interesting film tutelage from this 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 house and this 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 woman. And uh, do you, are you going to? Because I mean, that's a bit difficult now that times have changed. Are you going to try and? Do something similar for, you know, you mentioned you had a kid. So you're going to try and do uh, you, that? You're, you're laying the finger right into the wound because part of my big sadness is that not only in my work, but particularly to my daughter, it's so, it's almost impossible to pass on that sort of experience now to your kid. or And you don't want to be overbearing to where, again, uh, to make that such a, a chore for them, right, to where they reject it. But, you know, I try my best. We watch all the old MGM musicals. She's only four, but she loves to sing and dance. So I make sure it's Gene Kelly and, and Fred Astaire instead of, like, you know, Toucan, Sam, 3D, Animation, Disney. But you can only do so much. I mean, she's got her friends at the kindergarten, and, and that stuff is just everywhere with the iPad now. And they don't have an attention span. To us, we would be, like, if, if it was such a treat for us, we watched Madlock on TV. We watched Golden Girls. It didn't matter. It was just the fact that we could catch anything. That The streets of San Francisco on a rerun, it didn't matter. It, it was so precious, any of this kind of information of a movie. To them, it's like, you know, five-minute YouTube, change it and skip. And I, I tried my best, but it's almost impossible to to put that, you know, to 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 ham it in. It's It's... Yeah, I hope I hope I can lead by example, and eventually she comes around because I'm surrounded with this artwork, obviously, and my posters and my film love, and she sees it. But at the moment, I'm maybe I'm a little bit pessim more pessimistic than you would catch me at the beginning of the year because I've just got the huge chance um, to interact two of my dream projects that were sort of connected to my childhood, and they've both sort of flopped in the most horrible, painful way. And it's sort of, I'm, you're catching me in a little bit of a uh, sort of a, a sad moment, I would say, while I'm still trying to plow on. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's um, I don't know, at the moment, it's, it's hard to ignore all the things that are going on and still remain like completely optimistic about everything. But um, yeah, sort of going back, like you said, I was super fortunate because it was seamless. It wasn't a uh, put on to us like a religion. My parents, my father is like a crazy theater director. He's like Fitzgeraldo. He goes, I want an opera house in the jungle. So he was, he was uh, always, a, <laughs> it was a normal household. We would watch uh, movies all the time. It was a real currency, not only among my friends, but also in my family to have movie knowledge. 
And uh, but he was a little bit more crazy, you know. I would as this, this story, he was into Yudovsky way before anybody knew even what that was. He had caught that in the seventies in an old Florence porno theater. He had seen El Topo, and he was like. And every time I brought something to the table, like, oh, look at this movie I discovered. He was like, that's nothing. You haven't seen El Topo. And at the time, it wasn't available. It wasn't available. So, um, so it grew and grew. Like I said, this mythology around El Topo. And then when we finally got to see it around 2000, we, we rented, my friends had a movie club that we ran together and we, we found a copy and we screened it. And I was like blown away. Also making fun of him. Like he's like, oh, I, I remember it differently. <laughs> so, so it was kind of that. It was always the movies were always um, in in the household or, or currency, like I said. So uh, yeah, I was super fortunate. Uh, um, and um, and wh while they drifted in and out of importance, what I never lost touch was sort of the drawing and that that kind of engagement with it. Well, what's interesting, like uh, comparing our experience growing up, sort of in the eighties and nineties, and being into film and TV with with the experience that 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 kids are having currently like I, i've got a five five-year-old son and i think when we when we grew up if if you missed x files on that on that weeknight that was it you'd never see that episode again so you, th there was sort of this this cherished idea um that that existed be, be, because it was hard it was a little bit harder to see things I, I know you could go to to you know blockbuster or whatever and you could you could hide you know rent TV, uh, rent vhs but you know, I, I think today's kids, they're, they're not impressed by anything because everything is on demand. Everything's available. If they, if they want to watch something, it's there. It's on YouTube. It's on streaming, except obviously the kinds of movies that, that aren't available on those on those streaming sites. Oh, you right. Know. Exactly. Uh, you know, uh, there are heaps of them. almost everything that you illustrate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's I right. I try to light in some weird way that, you know, I always say if a streaming service, I type in John Gamba, if there's not at least five results, I'm not subscribing. But because you're not you're not providing any culture. And in a weird way, now that we've got, you know, Disney censoring, um, you know, French connection out of some weird political correctness idea again. And in, in a weird way, that's kept my work going because physical media is back when it was almost out like vinyl was. Now people are collecting the DVDs again and they're collecting a special edition and that's actually helping to preserve film culture much more than the current climate of streamers and Oscars and awards. And, and they're just sort of interested in that turn, churning out this wave of products to keep people subscribed. But the physical media editions of, I, I've, I've sort of, my big love is Japanese cinema and I'm, I'm always so baffled and, and actually angry that when I see the British Film Institute list of 100 best Japanese films in 2023 it's it's ridiculously basic level I mean it's so basic that uh, it's not been progressed really since the 1970s and and sort of I've tried to widen that by shining a little light through my my own artworks that I do privately personally that helping to bring these additions to life and there's there's been some ways forward where I'm I'm, I'm making little inroads on that and um and and a lot of the very cool distributors have helped to kind of like pres not only preserve that but actually still sort of catch interviews with some of those filmmakers as they are still alive just now and sort of create these editions that are a little bit in this sort of criterion model where you get the extra documentary you get a little bit of the insight and sort of that's been the much more reward we're rewarding sort of than the theatrical poster that's been just on a on a uh, last breath the, the last couple of years so um yeah that's sort of a way I I, I I I hope that through that we can sort of retain a little bit or get our kids a way back into this that's kind of a programming that we used to get on the BBC or we used to get like d deep interesting cultural discussions about movies on on public broadcasting which have completely disappeared well, b before we get uh, deeper in on on your artwork, you did mention the French Connection, and we actually have have a question on that. Um, we we reviewed that film recently, and we noticed that there is a very very uh, a very notice noticeable edit when uh, the character Popeye Doyle, who's played by Gene Hackman, says the N word, and it's been totally cut out of the movie on Apple TV and even on the Criterion Collection streaming version, which which really surprised me. What what's your view on on this type of, of, of censorship. 
Well, I, I can only reach out a gigantic middle finger to all sensitivity readers and anybody who's censoring Roald Dahl or, uh, you know, Ian Fleming. That is just, it drives me up the wall bonkers. You just don't consume it then. You got to preserve these works of art and they've been successful and 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 awarded for a reason. These These are masterpieces of our culture. And if you can't handle it, then you shouldn't consume it. But going back and changing for these arbitrary reasons, and we all could go much deeper into that with, uh, but it would get us all into hot water, is that there are powers to be at work right now that are so sinister and beyond even the well-meaning, on the surface, well-meaning uh, ta- uh, sort of agenda that's going on here. That is, is it's, it's, it's really, um, it makes me scared for a lot of things, for our kids, for our, for our, for our culture, for what we've achieved as, 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 as as a as human beings being able to read and understand and be smart enough to see the context of things and, and that's sort of uh, you know they are slow, sort of undermining this everywhere and yeah it's it's depressing for, uh, of, um, and the only way I can hope is that um, uh, yeah I hope uh, it's just a a period of time like we had before in the Renaissance maybe you know when Savonarola came in and said away with the art and music back to the church and dressing all in black and and, and then these stuffs go up and down in history. Uh, so uh, we can't be, uh, if you look back in the 70s and McCarthy, and we, we, uh, we've been certainly through these periods in time. But yeah, censoring artwork and um, for any reason, is, uh, I find it, I find it uh, uh, appalling, yeah. Yeah, we we have noticed some some fairly strange examples of this too. Like John often uh, talks about the example in Splash, where I think Disney has actually uh, used uh, used c- c- computer CGI to extend the the mermaid's hair in one scene to to, to cover her buttocks. You know, so I mean, I, 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 it's baffling. Like, who's coming up with that? That's that. That's one of the most uh, w- weird and grotesque examples. But it goes even to Richard Amisong, who is one of the masterpieces, masters of movie art, uh, and he's done, you know, the original Raiders poster. And many, many pe- people will know his artwork instantly when they look at it. The Mad Max, uh, the Thunderdome, oh, s- some of the absolute masterpieces of the genre. And he recently been censored by um, one of the streamers for his McCabe and Miss Miller poster, which is this beautiful oil painting on an actual slab of wood, which is a museum piece as an object in itself, was then photographed for the poster. So it's like beyond even a painting. And McCabe is uh, smoking his cigarillo. And now they've edited this out. So he's just holding his hand empty, like in this posture of a... And it's oh my McCabe God. doesn't hold anymore. So... It, yeah, these things are baffling. But there's and way worse sort of stuff in McCabe and Miller. Like, it doesn't make yeah, sense that because yeah. McCabe and Miller, it's it's existentially uh, quite upsetting. And there's a lot of uh, there's brothels in it and bad behavior and murder and death. And we're getting rid of the cigarette on the poster. And and that's a violation to the artist's estate and so beyond. But people feel I, I've come, yeah, I've come privately or, or or even professionally to this resolution that. I've tried to, and not to shame anybody and not to be negative, but I've sort of, every time I um, I get to these frustration points, I try to point these things out online. I've tried to, through my uh, friends and my, my platforms on social media, I've tried to show and kind of uphold just where we have reached in terms of just more like a quality level than any sort of morality. I'm just saying... Like, look what how good this used to be, and we should not let this slide. But every time I do, it ends up in this inevitable backlash and this giant misunderstanding, and you come off very bitter, and you come off sort of like you're the old man on the hill com- just complaining, and that's not what I want. And you actually do lose a lot of real jobs by, by being like this. So you, we all learn to shut up and conform in a way to, and I, I just resign to just, I hope if I can show the quality of my work that it will seep through and people will it will retrain the eye in sort of a way to to see the difference but like i said recently i've had two very cruel examples uh experiments almost happen to me where people can't tell anymore and that's sort of very disheartening and um it sends the wrong message in in every kind of way but we must be teachers in a sort of way for for the next generation we must point out somehow where um where we've 
where we can't let the quality slide. I'm just really talking now even about just the quality of painting versus AI and filters and, and all this other nonsense. Um, but it's hard. I, it's, 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 you get silenced and you get like shadow banned and all kinds of weirdness that's going on. Perhaps we should step back a little bit, uh, uh, Tony, and maybe, you know, what, are you, what is the role of a movie poster in, in your mind? Yeah, so in the old days, movie posters, it was the first kind of contact with the audience that hadn't even maybe seen trailers in the old days. It was just you pass along the highway or in the in their city or in the subway, or you would go like, oh, my God, this looks interesting. Just on the surface, pure. And often when I talk to clients and they're like, and they give me all the backstory of what they want to achieve with the poster, I always try to roll it back a little bit and I say, well, Let's just beyond her feeling all these emotions and the post of the character. She feels depressed, but also she's, you know, uh, she's strong, but also beaten down and all that. And I'm like, guys, let's try not to, this is too much. If we're lucky, you will communicate all these things, but let's just try to make something so super cool. It's like very basic that it will drive interest. And then we win. We already win. Like that, that's the role, the basic role. If we can do all the other things, that's fantastic. And if we can stand the test of time because we somehow included something else into it, even better. But we sort of got to step back to this original idea of what the poster does. It's an advertisement outside being able not to show the film or the trailer. And sort of with the phone and, and internet, that has changed a little bit because, you know, once the movie posters used to cover you know, entire theaters and they were hand painted. Now it's sort of down to a little phone screen or a trailer we catch on social media or, you know, the streaming uh, sort of uh, logo and icon where it has to be reduced down to very recognizable things. And I get the most depressing note I get most of the time now is that if it's painted, people think it's a cartoon. So then we'll reject it. And, and the sort of the, the, the big, uh, and, and you can't, you know, it's, it's hard to argue because, you know, they think they're sinking 250 million into advertising and uh, you don't want to be responsible for the one that's like pushing on the movie and then it doesn't do well. It's like, oh, because people didn't go because you painted it wrong. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a big, much higher stakes than it used to be as well. You know, a lot of times the old Colin Globus, you know, Canon Films model was to go to Cannes, paint a movie poster, have no movie, yes. but sell it on the basis of the poster. So if the poster was like Boris Vallejo, gladiators with like barbarians and a big snake, like and a sword, you would sell that poster. You would sell it on the basis of the artwork. And oftentimes it worked. It was like, oh, I want to see that movie. How many times did you have the experience growing up, Tony, where you would look at a, a, a film poster, particularly as Canon ones or anything like that, and then you'd watch the movie and you'd go, what the hell just happened? What did I just watch? <laughs> oh, the Where's time, the movie that I, I wanted? Cyborg. Oh, the time yeah, I Cyborg. Up, yeah, and exactly. And I grew up in Italy where they, they are the masters of false advertising. I mean, you, you'd see, I remember 2010 was sold as the sequel for 2001. Kubrick. So, you know, we, we were all like, oh, wow, this is the sequel. And it just told for lies just on the poster. Or but Watari <laughs> Ninja Boy, which is a great early uh, Japanese Tohei kids adventure ninja movie that I used to love as a kid and came on Italian te television. Well, on the Italian poster, it just said in the tradition of Disney, but the Disney was painted very big. So all the parents would take their their kids to a toy movie that's completely imported and cut up into pieces and thinking, oh, this is the newest Disney product. So yeah, and and I mean, forget all the barbarian run that we had, Ator and you know all these other your travelers through time. And I thought this was going to be Conan, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting. You mentioned Conan. I actually have the Conan poster you've you've uh, illustrated. I'm looking at it now on your website, which is it's super cool, and it's exactly doing what what you said a movie poster should do and look like fucking cool. But just to pick up on something you said about. Uh, you know, sort of painted posters versus, uh, you know, more 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 photography based posters. Uh, in in the current era where where there's just so much content online, I mean, do do film studio studios do do both now at all? I always say, why not? I always say, like like look at the cost of what it costs to hire me. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's not even the budget of a catering service. You know, it's like why not have. Like we used to have a German poster, a Spanish poster, an Italian poster. It only enriched the afterlife of the movies. It only enriched the fan engagement. Why do you why do you trying to narrow it down to such a slow degree? Why not have several posters? 
And of course, the best would be like I recently tried to streamline it all and make an international version and make it all out of the same artist's hand. That would have been, of course, ideal. But it that, that would take such a dedicated staff and such a keeping all the powers at bay. It's almost impossible now. But I I, I agree. I I'm for example, I'm pairing up with one of my uh, I'm one of my design heroes at, that's working currently is Midnight Marauder. He's based in Los Angeles, and we have sort of a little boutique. Uh, label that we run uh, on the side because of exactly what you mentioned. Oftentimes, clients want both versions. They want to see what it looks like there, what's, what it looks like there. And he sort of then takes over the typography and the layout, and I sort of provide the artwork, or vice versa. I, I do the other version, and he sort of gives a photo uh, option. Uh, and they're beautiful photo photographic posters, no, no doubt, in the history, especially Bill Gold, and in the 60s when it sort of changed a little bit. It's not even... Uh, it all has to be painted, but it should be. Um, I always think what I the only sort of sense of pride I have about my own work is that I can switch styles, I can switch eras. I wouldn't want to make the same fit for each uh, movie. I don't want to make the same type of poster. So if I do a comedy, Italian comedy from the 50s, it's going to be a very different style than if I make an 80s action movie. And I can sort of do that. And that's part of the big joy of my work is that I do switch up styles. It's different for Japanese movies than for Hong Kong movies. It's different for American movies than for Italian comedies. And I, I love that. That's a great freedom where in the art world, where I sort of come from, that was a big no. You have to maintain a style throughout your career. Otherwise, you are not marketable. And sort of film allows you to jump around a little bit and offer clients different solutions. And often the radical solutions are um, are, are a very different style than the sort of fully illustrated ones that we maybe like the Conan version or, or something like that. Well, you have a real love affair with Japan. Can, can you tell us about your relationship with the country? It, you know, is this your spiritual home? Absolutely. I've I've grown up so. But going back to my parents and sort of this this friendly rivalry with my father, the way he would say he would bring something to me, and I had to step up to the plate and I had to go. Okay, what's your? He was just don't just mimic me. Just what's your take on a movie? And he showed me Seven Samurai early on. I was six or something, and I was like ah, resisting it. It's black and white, and say like, I don't want to see this. And of course, from the first moment the movie hits and the music hits and you see the bandits, you're like, oh my god, a boy six years old. This was it. I was transported, transformed. I was never the same after this. This was sort of the big seminal movie event. And after that, I've sort of. Already reading manga early on in Italy, that was a big, uh, much earlier than in the rest of the world. We we grew up with this on TV. We watched all the cartoons. It's it's basically all Japanese from from Heidi and Binamaya and all these early cartoons, even to Fist of the North Star. I mean, this was just on TV. All the robots and uh, so uh, th there was a, a language that I already understood in terms of pacing and cutting and editing of action scenes. That's very Japanese. That's very different to the Western fights, for example. So if Gundam fights, the way he cut through with the sword and then there's a little pause at the end and it sort of see the robot split in the middle, that delay of action <laughs> yes. was something I saw mimicked in Kurosawa. I saw the slow down, slow motion violence with, uh, uh, of the sword fights and I was like, oh, I connected to that very subliminally at first and then later on by just researching and very quickly this became sort of my expertise in my family at first and among my friends where I could hold my own I was like oh you haven't seen this this is the real deal so it is a sense of pride that I had with Japan and then you know I was just consuming everything in terms of ninja samurai mythology you know growing up in Europe I, I, I was completely obsessed with castles and, and and Robin Hood and knights and and much more than cowboys and Indians, but that was sort of our medieval fantasy. And then see that connect to Japan and, and those and those tales. And then right, um, you know, when I was 19 or so, I traveled to Japan. I lived there for two years. I had a mini art scholarship that I extended into just never showing up and just traveling on the, on the tracks of Musashi and uh, went to the movies and watched every film, even not understanding Japanese. I just consumed everything that I finally had access to, which wasn't available in the West because, again, it was so limited to kind of Mitsuguchi, Ozu, Kurosawa, and sort of that's it. You know, we're meant to believe that that's it. And maybe a little bit, you know, female prisoner and Miko Kaji and maybe a Shogun assassin or something. But that's also service level basic uh, stuff. That when I hit Japan and you went to the video store there, all of a sudden it was like El Dorado. You know, you couldn't believe what's available. And 
yeah and I, I i all the way through i kept drawing even though that i wasn't in in the business in the movie business yet um i kept drawing and uh, being inspired by a japanese art film literature music anything i could soak up and when i got to finally visit it was only enhanced i mean i never i have nothing negative to say it was only like wow 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 and to the next amazing pinnacle and just walking in those real castles and seeing the floorboards and the ninja traps that were actually built in into alarm systems and it just i couldn't believe it it's 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 still to this day one of the, the my favorite times of my life that i i just spent there and um i always plan back as we maybe full circle to go and show my daughter and expose her to that because that's really where the culture is sort of very futuristic but the tradition is alive in a way that doesn't feel costume it doesn't feel put on it doesn't feel disney fine let's say well you're speaking my language tony in a way you don't understand so uh we, we, we have to talk about your one of your major projects that you have done okay we need to talk about uh the latest indiana jones film uh, for the dial of destiny i'm not joking around here this is literally one of the best indie posters in existence, and I'm, I mean that. Like, I mean, when I saw when I saw that Doll of Destiny poster, I know you're going to hate that because you love Drew Struzan, and we all love Drew Struzan, but I saw your poster and I was like, this is an incredible piece of work. No, it's not really because of that. It's a super painful topic, and I've sort of alluded to this before. Uh, this is part of my recent depression, and I can't. I'm sort of bound by uh, contracts, and as you can imagine, they have a sniper trained at me at all times. I thought I thought so, but let's we can talk about whatever whatever you like uh, about it. I can make me say just from my personal experience is just whatever everybody's seen is not my work. Even the poster you refer to, it's been messed with digitally. It's oh, been no. It's not my work. My work. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, and sort of just to clear up a little bit, I rejected that job. Uh, a couple of times out of respect for my heroes because I knew I couldn't live up to that. And it's not just Drew Struzan, it's much more, you know, Richard Amsel and Tom Yole who made my favorite indie works. But Drew, of course, put his stamp on it to a degree where I was like, there are some artists out there who are mimicking his style now that I think would have could have made everybody happy. So I kind of referred, and I know those guys, I'm friendly with those guys and I respect their work. And I was like, guys, just talk to them because first of all, indie means so much to me that I, I can't really step into those shoes. And I think the fans would be much more happier with one of those guys. And when they sort of keep, kept insisting and insisting, the way they finally got me was like, because those guys are also partly digital. And so when they finally got me was the one thing they could have got me with was we need a hand painted version to for indie on the last poster. This is sort of the... Uh, mangles of wish and 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 that's hit me right in the heart now of course I, at that point i couldn't reject it anymore and i had to step up to the plate and i had to say okay this is also this series means maybe more than any other to me in the terms of my way into art my way into the love of movies through drew struz and through the temple of doom poster that i would copy endlessly on my vhs and my next thought was okay i don't want to mimic them i cannot it's an insult i was I was looking at all the artwork that came before, and I don't want to make a pastiche of them. I don't want to make this. Uh, uh, and and everybody says, oh, we love the painted indie posters. And I said, well, there hasn't been a painted indie poster. These are all airbrushed with uh, pencils, which is much more, it's painted in a way, but it's very drawing. It's much more adjacent to drawing because it doesn't really apply thick paint. And there's been a Brian Bessus, uh UK quad poster with the beautiful Raiders typography where he doesn't wear the hat. And that's a, almost as close as we get to a painted poster. It's kind of thick gouache paint or, uh, or tempera paint layered. Um, that's as close as we've got with the Ethan poster. I've seen that one. He's got, he's got the whip. He's, he's doing the whip when he's got no that hat on. I got, which is the only, only reason this is not one of the most stunning posters. It's still amazing. It's one of my favorite uh, indie posters but if he had a hat it would have been out of this world but at this point that wasn't a sort of uh they he uh, that that shows you how free marketing was that poster made it through you know it, it got through all the uh, they just painted a uk version they were like oh he doesn't have a hat he doesn't have a leather jacket great it looks still looks fantastic let's put it out and it was everywhere it's a fantastic poster and now the safe gatekeepers will not even allow you know one anyhow it's going too far in this direction. So my idea was the only way I could approach this was to add 
myself into it and make a real painting. I would, that was my mission. I was like, let's paint an oil painting for Indy. And um, even though uh, the time, if we, uh, this, uh, it, it gets really nerdy here. In, in terms of illustration history, if we progress with Indy in his older age, we would be now in the 60s in New York. So that would be a great opportunity to give like a Bernie Fuchs, Bob Peak, very cool advertisement, 60s illustration book cover look to the whole thing. But it's weird because Drew kind of already took care of that. So in the 80s, he's already made a sort of nostalgic 80s, uh, but 60s version, very flat and sort of the highlights are airbrushed and, and it's very drawing and it's in incredible, but it's sort of out of its time. It's it's fun. So I, in order to paint, I'm actually going back in time and saying like, what could a 30s indie poster look like? What could it look like if it was like Lords of Arabia with real oil paint? And so that was my mission. And I, I painted um, two domestic posters, two domestic versions, one international version, which is my favorite, and one IMAX version. So there are full uh, oil paintings rendered, uh, the whole cycle of paintings that uh, I provided them with. And I got notes on and certain changes were made. And after a certain point, unfortunately, it's, uh, the communication broke off and uh, yeah, uh, I, I can't go into too much detail, but uh, with the version that's out there was, um, it's heartbreaking. It's so what about, what about the, what about the oil painting on your, on, on your Twitter, you've got, you've, you've released a, an, a, an oil painting that's in bubble wrap. Is that all yours? That's all you. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's, that was the international version that I posted yesterday because yesterday was the anniversary of, uh, Raiders being released on this day in 1981. So I figured it, would, it, it sort of felt too poignant that at the end of Raiders, we got, you know, the crate scene where the artwork, the arc is reeled back into storage without ever being seen. And Indy is sort of very depressed and sad at the end. And they're asking, who's, what, we're not going to explore the potential of this. And it's like, no, we got top men handling this, right? <laughs> top men. And so um, I felt this weird, I had to make, I had to sort of, because I've been into a slightly depression and a PTSD, if you want to even call it. Um, and I had to find a kind of ritual for me to, to, to even close with my own work. I poured so much blood and, and, and effort into this that just not being able to even to speak out in a bigger way about this uh, and show my work and, you know, sort of being hobbled like this, I had to find a little cleansing ritual for myself. So yesterday I used them to all wrap them up, put them all in storage, put them all in a box and sort of, wheel them into my own archive, which um, even though it was just a futile gesture, somehow it helped me to overcome sort of the depression because I've not only failed the fans and, and my own fandom as an indie uh, um, uh, childhood hero, I've also failed my heroes, you know, the people I've mentioned before. I hope to step up and deliver indie with the, his final goodbye and, and a real sort of a poster that wouldn't be ashamed to hang in this series. And I was sort of uh, I was sort of not allowed to do that, and 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 I got to find a way to get over it and not get too bogged down in my own depression, but just sort of keep moving forward. And it sort of links to all the topics we've um, alluded to before: is that it's our duty to remain positive and optimistic to show that there is a way. Um, I'm just at the moment I'm a little bit baffled. Um, there's a guy who would appreciate what you've done. There's a couple. There's a lot of filmmakers, and you have painted some of these guys. Orson Welles would appreciate what you've been through. Yeah, unfortunately, all I hear are the dead. <laughs> so. You've been, you've been um, uh, magnificent, Amberson. You know, you've been, you've had, and and all of your heroes who who are who are painted on your website, all the guys who are worth the damn have been fucked over in the way you, you may have been fucked over. That's exactly what my wife said. Like, no, oh, you've been manifesting this through your whole deeds. It's like, look at all your heroes. And I'm like, yes, I know. I mean, the faith is dictated in itself. And there's um, sort of a, a weird, beautiful poetry about it. And when I come from the fine art world, obviously, you know, Van Gogh is our shining example, our patron saint. Uh, we can always hold that up and say there's a, there's a real value in making something that doesn't please everybody. And and if you go out on your shield, at least I didn't compromise it. And it, it's sort of just sad that I, I hope to one day tell the full story. And uh, there are many 
great supporters in the story too. I don't want to seem too bitter about the process. I would have not even gotten through to the first selection if it wasn't for James Mangold. I mean, he was there all the way through as a, a basically probably the only champion of me. And it shows you that even he um, doesn't get um, his full wishes sometimes, or sometimes even a director doesn't even get uh, full power over his own project. Like you said, Orson Welles, you mentioned all the greats. And um, I, I don't know the full story of what went on behind uh, the scenes, so I, I'm hesitant to, to, to blame anybody, but all I know is um, I pre I, I, when I rejected the job is exactly for those reasons that came to be true in the end, and sort of it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I have those pieces, and um, it's for the next archaeologist to somehow dig them up, and one day maybe they can be released from this end of time. Well, maybe we could discuss your your process, which I'm I'm fascinated by. Um, so you you primarily work with with paint on canvas. Is that is that your sort of primary medium? Yeah, again, it switches uh, it switches to the subject. Um, I sometimes I love doing ink works. I love doing watercolors. I love doing anything really. I'm I'm not trained in any sort of art, so I always had this real. Um, loose approach to any medium because I wasn't really trained in anything. I come more from the graffiti self-actualizing background where we just used to go out and paint on trains and nobody would show us and you learn by doing. And that sort of bled over into all our our attitude towards anything, uh, which was make it. Don't ask for anybody to allow you in. Don't get an invite. Don't wait for people to call up on you. Do movie posters. I mean, I did six, I did 2,000 movie posters before anybody even hired me so and that this is just a passion that's i want to do this and i'm gonna do this and nobody can stop me and that's sort of a uh, uh, same approach into materials and process i sometimes i um i find something by accident that comes through my fine art practice that i used to do where it was a real open um i and i often ask the clients if you want a tony stella poster um let's not do too many sketches or or, or, or pre most because the paint in itself, the process will decide openings that we cannot foresee yet. And it's a scary proposition for a lot of clients, obviously, because they always think it's this open-ended um, um, approach. But what, what usually happens and what's very satisfying even for them later, that we have a bunch of options later that we can choose from because I let the process very much dictate rather than going from a approved sketch that has all the heads in place uh and then just executing that becomes very boring and maybe that's sort of where the indie project went wrong i got sort of this green light and i went ahead and i did all these versions that i thought would hold up to the past and and the future uh and and i should have probably yeah just gone and approve all the heads and and all that stuff but um that's not my preferred way to work and so i do have it's it's still I think why I keep doing is why I can always keep doing it because you surprise yourself constantly. I'm always shocked when I restart ever after a pre break that I don't know how to do it anymore. I'm like I'm sitting there I'm like God you used to know how to do this and then it takes me two three days to get warmed up within the new kind of feel of the movie and even the music. I let that all kind of sink in on me and kind of influence what I do on the paper, canvas, stone. I've painted on wood. I've painted, I've taken like a uh, Richard Amsalm. I've, I've painted, I made a sculpture that I then photographed and painted on top. I mean, there's no limits really. The only thing I really, really like to hold up is this to keep the computer at an absolute minimum. I really only use it to scan or photograph the artwork, clean it up and then layer the text on top and i would I, just i think this is what i can still contribute to hold that up i don't want to i'm not shaming anybody who uses the computer it's just something i my eye rejects it's sort of like reading glossy comic books i can't get into it as my my physical body reacts to that look that 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 machine look i can't i can't get into it and um so i want to keep that at a very minimum in my personal work and that's sort of uh, I don't enjoy it. I, I, I don't, that's the part I enjoy the least sort of when it gets into the computer and you have to prepare the files and you have to do all this stuff. And I can see all the possibilities, but um, if it's depressing. If you Google any sort of franchise poster now, let's say Lethal Weapon or something, the first three results are completely AI-generated sort of oil paint filter posters. 
And that's only going to get more and more and more and more and more. And so the garbage to weed through is going to get almost impossible. And so, yeah, I think the only value that I can really still bring is that I just hold strong and maintain this thing. And so there's a body of work later that people can look back and say, oh, when did you do this? Oh, 2025. That's cool. Somebody really held out, you know. But it's definitely hard, especially for my family to go, and go like, look, you have to support me in my, my crusade. <laughs> well, I, I noticed that you've, you've also done artwork for a number of jazz albums. And, oh, and, yeah. and s- some of my favorites that I've, I've seen on your website, uh, the, the Ron Carter album, where he's, play, he's a double bass player and he's got you know, these very long arms and fingers. And um, the Thad Jones, Mel Lewis album, I'm a, I'm a fan of that big band. So, you know, I, I respect that. And um, I also love some of the more abstract ones, like the Freddie Hubbard cover that you've got. Now, are you a jazz fan, or has have jazz? Yeah, have have labels approached you? No, these are all private works. So the, the book covers and LP covers that you see are all sort of made as a manifesting project, first privately and personally, but also manifesting because it book covers and vinyl art has been even on a steeper decline than movie posters. I mean, we see it in public advertisement, but book covers now, I cannot read most of these book editions because of the ugly covers. I mean, James Bond <laughs> is a perfect example. And these, we, we were so high and I, I refuse to have them in my library. And they always say, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, I always do. I cannot read this. <laughs> it just it has an effect on me. And so when I, um, I sort of do the novelizations of films that I enjoy doing because that kind of combines the works, or also just to sometimes to decompress, I listen to music and I just draw my the music I listen to. But again, it has roots to my father who was a big jazz aficionado and he helped um, out in the 70s with a lot of jazz festivals. And I got to meet a lot of jazz musicians. Lester Bowie is a family, was a family friend, the Art Ensemble of Chicago. And I, Nathan Davis came over for breakfast. And, and so we that was part of the family culture that I even more probably, it was natural. I didn't even value it too much. Again, you know, I was like, oh, this is normal. Here's, I, you know, here's a, a drawing I made of you and I gave it to a musician and, and it was very natural. And that, uh, that sort of maybe, uh, and yeah, that's sort of, again, being parents now, hopefully that's just something you can sort of provide along the edges without any pressure, um, no matter what, idiotic music taste I went through. My father was always just like, okay, that's enough now. Well, now we're playing this on the radio. And you're like, oh, come on, what is this? And and eventually you just love it and you grow into it. So yeah, this, this is all sort of very passion work. But to get vinyl, I've done a couple of official vinyl projects like, um, and again, dream projects, for example, to get Carter soundtrack for a Korean label that's going to come out. That's a huge, you know, mind-blowing passion project. But they are almost, I mean, they're so rare and so there's so little money in that. And there's such niche, you know, 2000 copies made. It's, it's, um, that is just really for the super hyper collectors market. Unfortunately, ne- not on the broad penguin now just hires a bunch of interns with when they slap a couple of filters on there or reuse famous paintings. But that culture of actually making a company recognizable through their design and their, their sensibilities, that's gone. That, that's a big shame. Well, before we leave jazz behind, like what I love about the the, the jazz artwork that you've done is, is you seem to have hinted at the style of, of sort of the bebop and post-bop era, which often had the main artist profile in sort of a, you know, sort of a, a, a completative or action pose, uh, quite often in, in tinted color with, with very prominent bold text. So I'm thinking of like the Blue Note label, for instance. But but you sort of enhance the action element with the use of, you know, the brush strokes, which I think pairs well with the unpredictable edge, uh, you know, edge of your seat sort of nature of jazz music. Was what was the balancing of of, of classic of the, the classic style of jazz artwork with, with your style, sort of a conscious thing? Yeah, you perfectly mentioned that. I mean, all the designers of the classic album, especially Blue Note, there's such a huge design history that then seeped over back into advertisement, back into movie posters, back into, it had a profound influence on magazine design. And if you pick up any magazine, even Holland Gardens or, you know, Horse and Hound in the 60s, it was amazing layouts and 
uh, uh, even if it was an article about a housewife sewing products, and it was a groundbreaking illustration artwork. And again, when I refer to, we expected a lot from the audience just to get it. Now it would never be done. There would be like a Bernie Fuchs diffuse glowing background with a family sitting in a sort of angled text, and then just a bold typeface across for a household product. I mean. This was glorious. These are masterpieces. And it enhanced everybody. Sort of like when we put on jazz and we go out with our wives into a, and somebody's playing a live jazz piano, it enhances the entire experience. It enhances your self-worth, your, your, your idea of society. And music has that power. And the design has that power. And now since it's all garbage of fine and sort of text everywhere and, and like uh, horrible barcodes, and so it, it depresses us. And we get a sort of blasted of techno Miley Cyrus into every possible venue. Uh, it's a, it's such a, a, a clogged up, it clogs our mind and our systems and it, 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 it becomes a garbage dump that you subconsciously constantly have to keep at bay and, and makes us all like, I, I feel honestly, I feel so hyper nervous and, uh, and, and distressed just being in any public space now. And, um, when you, when you, like I said, when you open a Playboy magazine, when you open anything, Olivetti typewriter commercial from the sixties, it was a beautiful laid out thought about design uh, done by professional. Uh, just on uh, on artwork, sort of in in today's day and age, you know, um, you know, vinyl records rise and fall in popularity, and I don't think vinyl will ever really be the dominant music playing medium. Uh, that that it used to be, you know, it, it, but vinyl vinyl has a physical scale that is very uh, conducive to great art. You know, even CDs had space to get creative with the insert booklet that could could be several pages. You know, and I've 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 seen a recent trend of bands releasing digitally with no text at all on their on their on their uh, artwork. I guess to to maximise that thumbnail art. You know, and I'm always disappointed that streaming services like Spotify don't allow you to at least click and expand the artwork on your phone. You know, all we're left with is this is this thumbnail image. You know, do you think it's time streaming services paid a bit more attention to the album artwork? No, I sort of I ignore all of that world. I put on blinders because I think that stuff will all survive as long as they l- allow us human beings to gather in groups and sort of dance and enjoy each other and each other's company and clubs and music. The vinyl is alive because all the DJs use it, all real people who care about the artwork and the music and the sound still only collect vinyl and it's never been dead really. I I mean, I enjoyed that moment when the CD came in because I was able to scoop up insane collections for nothing because people thought of, oh, I'll just throw out my, any granny would throw out uh, her husband's life's work of collecting vinyl. And, and sort of you, you uh, going around flea markets and garage sales back then in the 90s was a bliss. And now that's even risen in value. All my soundtracks and I have a lot of very valuable albums because now they are collected again. So I, I feel we are in the same um, relationship as we are with physical media, with laser discs are back all of a sudden, people rediscovering it because of the larger format, because of the higher quality, because of the beautiful design that went into it, the thought that went into these uh newly commissioned artworks often when the laser disc came out and again because star wars as a movie does not exist right now and this is sort mm-hmm. of an outrage the, the star wars there's only one star wars and that does not is nobody can now consume it it's 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 erased from our history collectively there are versions through fan efforts out there that you can sort of go but even that is not from the sourced from the original negatives and if, if if not supported by the powers to be so uh it if it, it depends on what you regard as our cultural heritage of all of us as human beings on this planet and it's the fact that uh, uh, it's not available it, it's it's a big shame but i feel that we what will survive is always this um there will be a small resistance that that cherishes this stuff and um i try to I tried to add some new things onto that and not just, um, uh, I don't feel it's necessary for me to make anything because I'm happy to live in the past and just watch all the f- great movies and uh, live in Charles Lawton's world. And I don't need anything new for me. I'm happy with what there is. I have, I've been such a collector and a nerd for so long and I haven't even scratched the surface of any of my passions. So I know there's enough for the rest of my life to explore and find. 
when it comes to when I have the chance, when I'm asked to do something, I would like to add a new drop to it to just as a little hopeful uh, bell at the end there that maybe an, another generation could find this, pick this up and follow along the model maybe. Well, I wanted to, the, the last place I want to go in, in the time we've got left, uh, Tony, I, I, you've got incredible taste in, in movies, uh, you know, I, I, just a scan down of some of the work that you've you've done, Night Moves, Rolling Thunder, One-Eyed Jacks, uh, Jean-Pierre Melville, Come and See, Tarkovsky, uh, Mad Max 2, The Hill, Seconds by Frankenheimer, which is a masterpiece. They, all the genuine article, these films, incredible taste. And I think you've talked about where some of those, some of that taste has come from, a little bit from your father, a little bit from that, that house that you used to per peruse, among other things. Um, so, you know, what, what to say? I mean, how, how does one cultivate this, this kind of taste now? You know what I mean? Like, uh, how, how do we, how do we transmit to people that, that, um, you know, because I'm I'm with you. I, I'm happy to, to live in the past and watch all these great movies. There's enough great stuff out there. I don't need to watch uh, the new stuff. So how how do we pass the torch? Well, we're all doing it in a little way. And a part of all the evils that the internet has provided, and uh, trust me, I was the first to reject all of it. I was uh, this is a uh, just is just a dark hole. But it's 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 gotten me through the last years. And honestly, connecting with people like you or what you do, shining a light on all this, giving me a space to talk. This was not possible in the old days. There were so many gatekeepers that wouldn't allow you through. And now if you just look on Twitter every day, people sort of shit on Twitter all the time. are so negative and it's so horrible. It's like, yeah, because you curate your own timeline. If you follow a bunch of politics and and thinks, of course, you're going to be depressed. You're going to be, it's, it's absolutely horrible. But if you've caught, follow cool people who are constantly making an effort to put positive things out there every day to make little suggestions, it feeds all. I've learned so much from people on Twitter or having other film podcasts that we connect with, putting the work out there, letting it speak. And yeah, once in a while, it finds an actualization. I find that now I have a really high standing in Japan. Because I connected with people from Japan who saw, I can't believe you know these movies. They, that, that's always the first interaction. And then it goes like, oh, yeah, I look at these. And they're like, oh, it goes even deeper than what they've suggested. So this, I think, is really, uh, 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 this is the, the way forward or the way to be or just to just maybe as therapy for all of us not to get too depressed like just keep going and surrounding yourself with the things that inspire you and that feed you and it's 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 often like i need to i know now after 20 years of of working in this field or creatively i know how to plug myself into this energy now and it's it used to take a while to shut out the bigger larger world out there and the sort of the letters from the gas company and all this stuff but if you can just watch a movie or put on an album for two three seconds now i have this shorthand that i can just interact and and and, and put on you know uh, uh, something that i can plug into i can communicate through time through history with all these great people and there's a conversation that goes on just in terms of quality that i can react to and it gives me a path to guide on and, and and a red thread to read on and a red thread to branch off of at each filmmaker. There's another branch of a tree that we can watch and deepen our knowledge. And yeah, it's a lonely samurai life, but um, I think through the internet, we can all connect on, the, on this way. And we recognize the monk that has chosen the same path and we sort of give a nod as we pass each other coming down or up from the mountain where we sort of say yes. <laughs> right way and um and and I, I think we're converting a lot of people more than we know each day by just showing uh, you know putting the putting your effort into buying space online putting on a conversation like this this is not just something you know that comes from from nothing this is effort it comes off your family's time it comes of your time it often comes of you know uh money it comes of, of all these costs uh, like me i say no to a bunch of projects i say no when it hits a certain point i say i won't do that i have my integrity and yeah it comes at a financial cost but it comes also uh at a quality control that we have to stop we have to we have the control of that part and it sort of that feeds us and makes us feel good about ourselves and makes us able to sleep at night that we we have an integrity there that lasts much longer than than any sort of other thing. And I feel through that, through this connection that we can sort of cultivate, we have a way to let other people uh, 
uh, you know, feel and have a look into our passions. And yeah, I hope it wasn't super too negative uh, right now, but um, um, I feel we need to also address some of it. So to 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 know where the problems are at and not just let it slide. Mm. Well, I, I think the positives have definitely outweighed the negatives in our chat today, Tony. Uh, as a final question, we usually ask our guests uh, our guests uh, what books they're currently reading, but I think you're a special case today. So we'd like to know what you're watching right now. So what was the last film you saw? So I'm a, a bit of a, I, as you both know, as, as young parents like me, uh, the book pile is just stacking up without being a- ever able to tackle it i've got i've got <laughs> many that i've i've got but I, th- I i i think i will start to read again when she leaves for college or when she's you know 18 <laughs> out of the house i my brain is destroyed honestly it's it's not only because of my recent like uh uh illness it's just sort of the nature of the short content and you have to manage the household you have to manage the clients you have multiple projects going on and in order to read to decompress and find yourself into that world it's almost impossible now to shut it all out because you drift on a page much easier than watching a movie you just sort of i read a paragraph and i don't know what i read i just thought about you know bills to pay or something and you're like okay i force myself back into it and i force myself to concentrate and as soon as i do i fall asleep so the only reading I now do is if when I prepare for a podcast, like I recently did um, uh, Dr. No because of the anniversary and I, I sort of unloaded all my pent up anger and frustration and my love for James Bond and Sean Connery in that podcast. And sort of I went through and reread most of the Flemings. So that was the last book I read, the uncensored Flemings that I, I gladly I have in my bookshelf. So uh, mm. hands off my Fleming. Um and, I, and, and I what about films, that. Tony? What, what What's the last film that, you, that you've watched? The last film, what did I watch? I watched something. I watched like four or five films every day, but they're all chunks. Again, I don't have time to like kind of sit through. A lot of it is for work and a lot of it is to, like I said, is to get out of a rut or depression, like a sadness. So sometimes I think it was Marx Brothers uh, Room Service and only because Room Service, not because it's my favorite Marx Brothers or something, but... I think it's the only one available on one of those uh, Amazon or whatever. I, I didn't sure. feel like I was like I wanted to watch. Um, I want to watch a nut. I came for something that just I, I needed something to zone out and not think and f- make me feel good. So nothing was able, and I was like, oh. And then I just went down the endless list of icons, and I was on Mark's Express. I was like, ah, oh, okay, room service, great. I love that turkey scene. It always makes me happy. So. Yeah, it was something like that. And then on on the other research end of it or project end of it, there's always a tons of um, movies I watch um, uh, just to get re-inspired sometimes. But I, like I said, often it only takes me 10 minutes to plug into that world and I can shut it off and I'm sort of run down to the easel and I'm expired and I can start painting because I'm now plugged into the world. I remember it. I remember Touch of Evil and I can just sort of go. I don't need to watch the full movie. You'll appreciate this, Tony. I um, uh, uh, my my wife goes out on some Saturday nights. I don't. I I just don't. And um, so it's me and my daughter, and uh, you know she's around, and we don't do a lot of screen time at all, really. But I always make exceptions on the on the TV, like when we're just hanging out. I put on North by Northwest or something cool like that because I want these people to be. I want Roger Thornhill and you know all, all these characters to be friends to her growing up, you know, and I want I just want them to be around, you know, to in the words of another guest we had, Spencer Claven. I want I want this to be the furniture of her mind. I want uh, great films, and if I just don't put, I mean, look, everyone, people, there's a lot of people, a lot of people listening to this who aren't going to like this because they like the Wiggles and all that. But what if I just didn't do the Wiggles in my house and I put on Singing in the Rain instead, like the other night, which I did, and we sung and danced to that. And, and I, that, I think that was a better spending April, of my time. Absolutely. From my soul, my daughter is four, and I did that all growing up. She knows every lyric to every MGM musical. She, When Gene Kelly comes on, she's like, yes, and she loves it, and she goes into her dancing routine. And, of course, I couldn't keep the other stuff at bay, Paw Patrol, or Peppa Pig, whatever invaded our home. Uh, and I tried not to make an energy around it or forbid it because it's a losing battle. But... Again, like you put that beautiful, the furniture of her 
of her mind that this is just something she can draw on later. There's a sort of sense memory to the sound of the time or even to be able to sing the, the lyrics, to singing in the rain. She knows about heart. She does the routine with the umbrella. And it's something we did together. And it's something we share. And I don't know if, if it will carry all the way through her life, but here's something. I'm not a big Paul Thomas Anderson fan, but on one of his interviews, I think with Tarantino, where they were both sort of really unlikable by the end, uh, there was a beautiful anecdote by him that came through uh, or maybe his wife Maya Rudolph said it or something he has a TV in the house that only shows TCM but 24 hours it's just all wonderful and that's great and he wants it to permeate the house he doesn't force anybody to watch it he doesn't want anybody it's sort of in the laundry room but it's always a sound of the house that you would pass by and there's big tag me on or like we used to grow up as children you know like you, it was just we were fortunate that this was regular programming like you catch a, a monster from the black lagoon and you just sort of pass by coming out with your football and you're like oh what's that like cool and you drift in and out of your uncles watching something like that or you know that i find i find that i really wanted to copy it i haven't achieved that yet but i thought if you have a house where they sort of could be drifting in and out of the rooms, a general sense of an air of that, that would be, uh, that's a, a, a that's something I totally love. Well, Tony, we, we could literally talk for hours, but uh, we have to wrap it up. And uh, but So where can people find you online? Where can people, how can people find you and your work? I think, um, yeah, the best you already uh, said, the website is where it's only the tip of the iceberg uh, of my work, but it's sort of, it's sort of chaotic. I don't know really how to categorize it any better, but that's that's a great uh, uh, jumping off point. And then sort of Instagram, I think it's all something Studio T Stella, Studio Stella, something along those lines on Twitter because everything else is just a pizzeria. You know, Tony Stella is just either a, a mob lawyer or a pizzeria. <laughs> <laughs> everything else is it's always a Studio T Stella. Uh, yeah, on all social medias. And there I will go into podcasts, uh, threads I create for other episodes I did. And I try to not only just show my work, but also a little bit of, you know, film knowledge and history and sort of the things I'm currently viewing and and and, and finding connections with. And sort of, I, I, it's like a mini film. Um, um, again, the interactions, like I said, it creates many wonderful interactions with other people that ta taught me many things. And I would link to their sides. And I, I find that still with all the politics, the most uh, satisfying thing is just the communication on Twitter and, and other film fans. And thank you so much for having me on. I, I loved it. And uh, this was an easy one. I didn't, it was all from the from the gut because yeah, I didn't have any research <laughs> myself for once. Ah, <laughs> uh, Tony. They, we, look, I think we, we I, I'm sensing we have to do this again before the year oh, is for out. Oh, sure. Any time, yeah. Or well, any topic to also, like you said, if you have another, just a pure film topic, I I, I, I love I love bouncing off, off that with other uh, uh, views and ideas and, I feel like we should talk about come and see. Which oh yeah, is a... oh, we'll talk about the pressing. Let's let's go to this. <laughs> <laughs> let's, 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 yeah, let's take a break in between and do a sort of like oh yeah yeah oh but that's that's a heavy one for sure yeah. Yes, for sure. All right, thanks so much, Tony. We'll catch up again. Thank you so much, guys, and all the luck of working out the wiggles and putting on to Gene Kelly everywhere. <laughs> <laughs>